Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the Florida Friendly Landscaping webinar series. It's 1059. We're going to let people have a, a minute or two more to keep logging on, but we will get started, you know, right, right around 11 o'clock. And um, we're looking forward to um, hearing from you all today. I'm still getting a few more people um, logging on, but I'm going to go ahead and get started. It is 11 o'clock, and I'd like to welcome everybody to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Homeowner, Homeowner Webinar Series. Today's webinar is Shade Gardening. Um, this webinar will provide an overview of plants that will thrive in the shade of your Florida yard. And um, our extension agent, Hannah Wooten, is going to be um, presenting to us today. This is part of a monthly webinar series, and our next webinar is on the FFL principle of mulch with um, Dr. Chris Marble. And just so you know, it looks like people are pretty familiar. I see a lot of people using the chat, so that's great. Um, your microphones have been muted in this webinar, so please continue to use either the chat box or the Q&A box for any questions that you have. We'll take those questions at the end of the presentation. Also, you will see a survey invitation pop up. Please take a moment to fill that out. Um, and now I would like to introduce today's speaker. Hannah Wooten is the UF IFAS Extension Agent, um, the Commercial Horticulture Agent in Orange County. In this role, she provides education to support a vibrant green industry and a sustainable food system. Her trainings and partnerships promote environmental stewardship through the integrated pest management trainings and education about urban farming techniques with an emphasis on hydroponics. Through strategic um, scientific communication, Hannah aims to cultivate beautiful, sustainable landscapes across Central Florida. She obtained her BS from the University of Florida in landscape and nursery horticulture and a minor in agribusiness management. She is pursuing her MS in agroecology and has been working 10 plus years as the horticultural professional in her hometown of Orlando County, Florida. Um, if you have um, any questions, like I said, please put those in the chat box. And with that, I'm gonna turn the, the screen over to Hannah. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present on the statewide Florida friendly landscaping webinar today. Um, I love getting to talk about Florida friendly landscaping. I'm so lucky that this is my job and that I get to work with all of you every day. Um, I am really excited to give this presentation today. Don't throw it, grow in it, gardening in the shade. So uh, our topics today are really going to uh, start by talking about the importance of shade. We'll talk about shade maybe in ways that we haven't thought about it before. Shade is cool, <laughs> quite literally. The temperatures in our shaded areas are actually cooler, and that's something that we should consider, especially in hot, sunny Florida. But we know that shade has a lot of challenges. So, uh, you know, our plants need light to grow and shade is going to get in the way of that. So how do we work with the challenges of shade and how do we find solutions for working with the shade, looking to light, color, texture, supporting wildlife and some different strategies and approaches to working with different Florida friendly plants to overcome your shade challenges in ways that are still satisfying to you and to the nature surrounding us. So this is really just to uh, start get us thinking, getting us thinking about shade. So too much what contributes to climate change and trees use blank to make energy and grow. Well, uh, it's carbon dioxide. Too much carbon dioxide contributes to climate change and trees use carbon dioxide to make energy and grow. So I just wanna get us started recognizing that we have some real climate challenges, but we also have some real climate solutions and trees are one of them. So we will start this shade presentation talking a little bit about energy and climate so that we can frame this conversation so we know why it's important for us to think about shade and to think about the 
long live trees, why we should maybe preserve them. Um, and it's because shade um, helps with temperature mitigation. And here in Florida, we use more energy than any other state except for Texas. So um, over 40% of the US household energy consumption, um, it, Florida uses more than 40%. And 90% of our energy comes from burning fossil fuels. Sea level rise is something that is increasing in Florida. We are characterized by sea level rise, um, just our geology is. But with the increase in carbon dioxide in our atmospheres, we, we know that with rising temperatures, we're uh, intensifying our sea level rise situation. Uh, we have El Nino and La Nina, which further intensify our sea level rise challenges. And when we have storms like hurricanes with high tides, we can get massive flooding as we have experienced just last fall with our hurricanes. We know that climate change is really expensive and it could cost over $75 billion in the next 20 years. So we really need to consider how we build. We need to build smarter and we need to plant more trees or really think about how to keep more trees because we do have carbon problems, but we also have carbon solutions. So climate change is driven by increases in greenhouse gases that are trapped in our atmosphere. And it has gone up over 400% since 1950. And those trends are aligned with industrialization. But guess what? Plants use carbon dioxide to make energy. And I don't want to oversimplify such a complex problem, but I do want us to recognize that the beautiful green plants all around us are carbon-based solutions. The soil that our plants grow in are carbon-based solutions that can get carbon out of the atmosphere, into the soil, and into the plants. So we can make future diamonds after all. So our solutions, we need to be more more energy efficient wherever possible. So we're using less energy and we need to think about our natural areas, our green spaces, agriculture, and our managed landscapes. We forget about the highways in the sky above our heads, especially in urban landscapes. We forget that so much biodiversity, so much terrestrial biodiversity exist in our tree canopies. So in and around urban areas, we can support an abundance of life right above our heads. So plants are a part of the solution. Trees and shade are a part of the solution. Ag is part of the answer. Where and how we grow plants from farms to greenhouses to landscapes to backyards to cities to natural areas. It's all important. So let's think about our green spaces. Let's think about how to connect them and, of course, how to support the canopy highway above our heads. So trees are cool. They have a cooling effect. They lower energy bills. They increase home values between like 10 and 20%. So just by maintaining your tree, you could be increasing your home value. You could be making tens of thousands more dollars on your home. You have less carbon dioxide emissions, less air conditioning used, and you have more trees to help take up that added carbon dioxide from all of our use of fossil fuels. We have fewer heat-related hospitalizations and deaths, and this is something that we don't think about enough, but heat is actually like the number one killer when it comes to natural disaster-related death around the world. It's heat, and that is both direct and indirect. People have heat stroke-related issues, outdoor workers, but also those like little small effects of people living in um, warm temperatures with uh, inefficient cooling systems. We have a lot of issues related to heat injury and heat stress that has very negative health impacts in and around our own communities 
We just don't talk about it very much. Um, skin cancer. I had skin cancer removed from my face at the age of 30. Um, so we have a lot of uh, challenges with a lot of sunlight and thinking about how we exist in and around shade can help us with other very common health issues that we face every single day. And of course, biodiversity. Over 50% of life is considered... Uh, terrestrial life is estimated to be held in our tree canopy. Trees even produce their own soils. Just take a deep dive of reading Dr. Nalini Nadkarni to learn more about all of the stuff that we don't think about in our trees. So trees are cool and we really should think about them beyond just their beauty. Um, shade inequality is something that does exist, and I highly recommend a National Geographic article if you're interested in reading more from the July 2001 issue. Um, it does this expose of Los Angeles, and uh, you can do a little satellite survey of your own county in the state of Florida, your own neck of the woods, and you can see that affluent areas do tend to have more tree canopy than lower income neighborhoods. That means that there are warmer temperatures and certain zip codes than other others. So that means independent of climate change, like you could just not even care. <laughs> we have differences in multiple degrees of temperature within a few miles of neighborhoods within our own cities. And that has to do with our landscapes. This requires air conditionings to work harder and thus power bills are increasing, especially in areas that are already uh, more limited with resources. More carbon dioxide is getting pumped out to run those less efficient air conditionings and more carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere further contributing to the climate change that increases the likelihood and frequency of these natural disasters which are devastating. And we face this all the time here in Florida. And neighborhoods with tree canopy do have higher property values. So this is just a really good way to look at how different zip codes from an aerial standpoint um, are different. Uh, how we landscape is different. And in general, uh, more affluent areas do have more tree canopy cover. Um, folks are more likely to spend money on maintaining trees. Counties and municipalities are more likely to maintain the tree than to rip it out if it's having issues. Um, and then there's even some old school information that talks about back in the 80s, police like to use a lot of helicopter surveillance. So they ripped out trees in areas where trees were getting in the way of security. But technology can overcome a lot of those challenges. We have new methods of um, doing surveillance and of, you know, being able to have little cameras everywhere. So maybe we can have trees and we, we can have security too. And it just takes a few decades of rethinking our approach to shade, shady areas, and how we can uh, landscape better thinking beyond just trees are cool. So I also like for us to think about the state of Florida um, from a development perspective. We know that folks love to live here. They love to travel to this state. Um, I love living in Florida. I cannot blame anyone for wanting to move to paradise, but we have a few different situations with the future of Florida. We have the now. Um, you can see this was done in, back in 2010, um, where you can see what things look like now-ish. If we continue to develop at the same pace that things have been going, um, you will see the state and in 2070 will look more like that middle picture where all of those red spaces will be paved essentially. Then you can see on the uh, 2070 alternative, we're still very developed. We are a lot more developed than our current state. We recognize that's happening. We know a thousand people on average move here daily, um, but we can develop smarter. And that's what I'm proposing here. And that's where I'm proposing that we can 
consider the role of shade, the role of trees in our landscapes and our canopies above our heads. So have you ever really thought about how trees impact temperature, property value, big picture climate change? Well, uh, now we've talked about all the reasons why we want to care about these things. We know shade is important, so here is how to grow in it. I re I'd really like to start by encouraging folks to embrace shade. Um, I know with our love of turf grasses that and our the turf's need for about a minimum of six hours of full sunlight, that's where a lot of folks uh, having nice a, a predictable turf grass is something a lot of folks desire and they like that shaded lawn look. But unfortunately that is just not a reasonable expectation. While some uh, turf looks beautiful under seemingly dense shade. Sometimes those are old cultivars. It's just not an expectation. Sometimes those are management practices that go into maintaining that really beautiful space. Um, but it's really not reasonable for us to expect shade to thrive or turf to thrive in shady spaces. So we should embrace shade in ways beyond just that turf idea. Maybe thinking of how to mulch, still a little lower maintenance, but even better than that, let's add plants. Let's play with the light and shadow. Let's add pops of color and interest. And let's include a variety of different textures and depth and create a garden that maybe even glows. In shady areas, the play of the light and shadow is something that is never the same. There's always some interest generated in these areas. And um, for me, I, I'm so lucky to come from a, very, a family with a very artistic eye and things like the play of light and shadow and shady areas, I think could design future fabric patterns or paintings. Like it, what nature can bring and the playfulness that it brings is so beautiful. And it's something that we can just embrace. Colorful foliage do, can do very well. In fact, sometimes that's exactly how and why it has adapted. These plants have adapted all of these beautiful colors it's because these are the different pigments that allow these plants to thrive in different levels of light. And texture and depth. We can provide a lot of interest, almost that uh, yearning for more exploration, like, whoa, what's back there? Where's the stream coming from? Or are those eyes looking at me coming down this trunk pattern? And let's not forget to look up because the canopy can provide a lot of interest as well. And shade provides a lot of benefits, like the science is there. We have good science that talks about the sun protection and benefits from shade, the cooling effect of shade, and that people are actually healthier and happier when they are in proximity to green space. When you can look out a window and see something green, people are happier and healthier. We also have wildlife. Um, urban wildlife is phenomenally amazing. The fact that critters can thrive in our human influenced ecosystems is so cool. So let's not forget about the habitat that we can provide in these areas. And I just uh, saw a few months back, one of our UF researchers did a project that's showing that uh, what our traditional landscapes are offering is actually a little bit more disconnected from what people want in their yards. And people value wildlife in urban areas, like in average backyards. It seems like 
we have science that shows that it seems like we, uh, our traditional landscaping maintenance is missing out on that wildlife piece. So that's really cool to think that people value this stuff. People like to see their, you know, the little neighborhood raccoon doing the rounds in the backyard or the little evidence of your possum friend. Um, so making sure that we do have some habitat and our tree canopies, little snags and holes, things for the hawks to perch up on while they're hunting. This is all providing a lot more benefits than just that cooling effect. Um, we have added protection for wildlife in these areas and a lot of different food, you know, even the beetles that might be breaking down an old dead tree in an area where it's not a safety concern. This is all good for our wildlife, which deserves to have a space in and around our managed landscapes too, just like us people. And we should always think about how we're connecting corridors, whether it's um, actual connected green spaces or if it's through the treetops up above our heads, how are those branches connecting? Can squirrels run through those branches even if things seem disconnected to us people? Just some things for us to think about. <laughs> But shade can be really challenging. And this is the reality that some of us face. Plants need light to grow. Like that's what they eat. Plants eat light and shade limits light. So turf and shade, very challenging. Shifting light and shade throughout the day can be challenging. Um, some, ch some plants can deal with it, no problem. And other ones, they have get one hour of full sun in that changing pattern of light, and that's enough to burn uh, that leaf. So you do need to understand your plants and their preferences, and deep, deep shade can be incredibly challenging, um, where you might just need to think of some alternatives overall uh, if the light is, is so limited that nothing can really grow. Shade from buildings can be a real challenge, um, especially in urban areas and shady areas that are particularly wet, dry, or heavily rooted can cause a lot of challenges for the landscaper. So things that we should think about when we're talking thinking about how to work with shade. How many hours of sunlight um, are, thing is, are the plants gonna be exposed to? Is it full sun? Is it dappled? Is it shifting? Is the shade maybe too dense? Can tree pruning increase some light levels for the plants below? And if so, that's something that you would wanna work with a certified arborist to make those determinations. Um, that is something, you know, again, well-maintained safe trees are what we're going for here. And that does mean that we sh should consider that long-term maintenance expense. And I think that's something realtors should really think about and maybe have that conversation when um, homeowners are shopping for a house. We, we don't really talk about the tree maintenance piece, but it is an expensive piece and it is a big part of the value added to your home. Uh, and think about if features or themes can be included in your shade gardens from containers to benches, maybe different art, fountains, bird baths, wind chimes, fairy gardens, um, especially if there are some areas that are just maybe too challenging to think about getting another plant in there. Uh, we do have some warmer microclimates under the tree canopy. So depending on what part of the state you are in here, I'm in central Florida. Um, I'm in Orlando and my shade canopy is what provides me with just enough of a microclimate where I can sneak in some of my favorite tropical plants just a little bit farther north than here no sneaking, <laughs> they will die. But my tree canopy provides just enough uh, insulation that I can sneak in some more tropical stuff than what would typically be sneakable in my zone 9B. Um, if you're digging among roots around tree bases, use small plants, water them regularly for establishment because it's almost like working among uh, rocks you know it's not but you're 
working among roots, not as much soil. Um, and then fertilizer does not compensate for sunlight. So fertilizer is not a substitute for photosynthesis. If something is seriously struggling, adding fertilizer, it, it's not, it, it might not help the situation. Fertilizer is not a substitute for sunlight. Uh, if you are working with turf, if you are in a situation where you can get some turf in a slightly shady area, mow the turf a bit higher, reduce the fertilizer inputs, reduce watering, and reduce expectations. These are all strategies that will keep our turf from getting as stressed because we're not forcing it to grow faster than what it has the diet for under there. It doesn't really have enough light to be mowed and fertilized in the same manner as our full sun turf. And this is a Florida friendly landscaping presentation. So this is all about selecting the right plant for the right place. So let's talk about some shade plant selections. We'll talk about the amazing azaleas, the broadleaf broads, colorful C's. I realized a lot of uh, phenomenal shade plants start with the letter C. Um, let's not forget about our epic epiphytes, our native woodland wonders, good old ground covers if you find flowers and shade tolerant turf. So these are the books for you to dive in and take more time than what we have together today, but I know you guys are probably quite familiar with our resources at this point. And we need to always be aware that we have hardiness zones. Just when you think we're getting tropical and the climate has changed enough to speak in your favorite tropical plants, we get blasted with freezing temperatures on Christmas. So this is why our hardiness zones matter for real. Um, it's because there are plants that are better adapted to different areas and we do need to stick to these zones. I've had folks call me and they're like, hey, we want to know why this plant isn't on the Florida friendly list in my zip code and they're like it grows really well in this area and I'm like have you had a freeze yet since you've been living here no no does it freeze in central Florida and I'm sure those same folks right now today are probably having to remove some of those tropical plants they thought they could sneak into zone 9b uh, without any canopy or any way to uh, create a microclimate. So know your hardiness zone, use the map, be observant, look at plants around you um, and recognize if you may or may not be in a little bit of a microclimate or even have one in your own backyard. So the amazing azaleas. So we have azaleas that are non-native, but they are um, Florida friendly. And then we even have a Florida native azalea. I haven't seen it yet personally, but when I learned about it, I just thought how phenomenal this thing looks. So um, these plants will thrive from zones 10, uh, 8A to 10A. And we have some species that are native to Florida. They might not be as easy to find as as the uh, more traditional non-native azaleas, but these can provide beautiful color. Um, they do well in a partially shaded situation. They can deal with any textured soil as long as it's pretty well drained, but they do prefer an acid to slightly acidic soil situation. So if you are um, dealing with a more acid soil, we like to teach to put the right plant in the right place. So if you have a soil that is a little bit more on the acidic side, the azaleas could be a fantastic choice. Um, if you don't have the soil type for that, um, it, it might take added inputs, which means added work. That's not as Florida friendly. So that's really just a com conversation to have with the homeowner. Um, but these are some really fantastic options. In general, our broadleaf plants are better adapted for shade. Like this is just a general rule, but big leaves intercept the filtered light below the tree canopy. So we have things like this um, leopard plant or like the tractor seat plant uh, and this peacock ginger here. So when you do see broader leaves, those are 
typically, not always 100%, but typically better adapted. Those are their giant solar panels prepared to intercept the filtered light coming through beneath the canopy. And the colorful seas, starting with crotons. So these cannot grow all across the state, but central and south uh, between zones 10A and 11, crotons are a definite landscape plant favorite. They are not native to Florida, but they are very popular for giving the pops of tropical color. We've got lots of greenhouse growers that focus on crotons in, uh, in central and south Florida, and they can deal with partial or full sun. So especially when you have the shifting light situations, you can get some full sun blasting on these things and it will just illuminate all of the different colors on these beautiful leaves but it will move throughout the day and the croton can handle that pretty well other plants might not be able to get that that momentary blast of sunlight so this could be something really great where you have some extreme shifts in your amounts of sun throughout the day um, and this one is pretty tolerant of a variety of soil conditions so this is a good one and you can stay basic you can get some beautiful crotons at your local big box store but you can get really weird with this too um, i think the really cool one in here was maybe a king siam or king of siam or something like that um, this was a local specimen at lou gardens lou botanical gardens here in orlando so come on down and pay a visit if you're curious uh coleus and calathea or calathea these are some other colorful seeds that thrive in shady conditions. So um, our coleus come in so many different shapes and colors, and we have some UF varieties that we can show off as well. Um, these do great in Florida. They will get hit with the cold, even just a hint of cold in your coleus are just like, oh, they're uh, divas about it. Um, they like to be nice and toasty. And um, the Calatheas just offer that really beautiful, you know, it is more of a kind of resort feel, but they can really offer some beautiful tropical foliage in some deeper shaded areas. And this is a plant that comes in a lot of different shapes and sizes. Breeders have gotten their hands on these plants, both of them, and they have gone crazy with all of the different uh, shapes and colors and sizes and frills uh, through their plant breeding efforts. So have fun with these guys. And another colorful sea, the cordyline, also commonly known as the Thai plant or Hawaiian Thai. Um, these grow from zone 9A to 11. So they do like things uh, nice and toasty and a, a little bit more in the tropical category. Uh, they're not native to Florida, but these are another one similar to those crotons that can deal with partial to full sun. So when you've got shifting light, these are going to um, show off different tones of color as you have that shifting light throughout the day. And these also come in different colors, shapes, and sizes, um, still all with that very beautiful, very, very tropical look. Um, they do well in any texture of soil. They do well um, with well to medium drain and slightly acid to slightly alkaline. So they're not too picky at all. And again, you can find some kind of, you know, basic beauties at your big box stores, but you can find some growers across the state, do a little Google search of weird Hawaiian ties in Florida. And I promise you will come across some growers that have some very interesting collections of these plants. So you can show them off to your neighbors. And uh, the very popular colorful sea, the camellia. This one, um, you know, folks have their favorite camellias and who can blame them? They, when they are in full bloom, they are something special. Um, they are not always easy. Sometimes our camellias can be a little bit of a diva, but these are such gorgeous shade plants, especially here in the Southeastern United States um, that we we do need to mention them. Um, they grow from zone 6A to 9B. They are not native to Florida and they can do well in 
full shade to partial shade areas, and they prefer a more acidic, slightly acidic soil environment. Um, and fun fact, does anyone know which type of camellia is the most famous camellia in all the world? It's Camellia sinensis, and it is probably the most consumed beverage in all of the world too. It is tea. Our tea comes from a camellia plant. So uh, it's not from one of the camellias that we usually associate with our landscapes, but it is um, from a camellia plant. And I always like to make sure we remember that so many of our favorite food and drink comes from our plants that might be landscape plants hidden in plain sight. So, okay. So um, what is an epiphyte? And does anyone know the most common epiphyte in Florida? Well, epiphytes are air plants. So these are plants that grow up on trees. They are not growing in the soil. And the most common epiphyte in Florida is Spanish moss, which is neither Spanish nor moss. It is a Tillandsia. Um, and Tillandsias are closely related to our bromeliads. You'll see other Tillandsias that look more like that typical bromeliad, that kind of pineapple look. But I think it's kind of neat when you start thinking like, oh, wow, that's not a moss, that's a bromeliad? That's re or it's a related to a bromeliad? You can really start to think about how much fantastic life we have just existing up in our treetops. So bromeliads are air plants in nature, meaning that they do grow in trees, and they're a really phenomenal choice for shady areas, especially if you have challenging roots in soil. So bromeliads can overcome the like knobby, craggy uh, root thick areas and they can be really colorful. They can start climbing up trees. Um, we have native bromeliads. We have non-native bromeliads. People breed all kinds of bromeliads and they clump and climb really beautifully. Um, one of the common downsides associated with bromeliads is that um, they're important for ecology of mosquitoes. <laughs> so Folks don't love bromeliads because they hold water in their little bromeliad tanks. Um, but again, that's really important in nature. In fact, um, I've, there's a little feral cat <laughs> community in my neighborhood. And sometimes I see the feral cats, that's where they'll find their little sip of fresh water. So I never really thought about the role that bromeliads played in um, feeding or, you know, providing a place for wildlife to get a little drink of water, even when things are really dry. But these are really important plants in nature. A lot of our frogs live in them. Um, and it's just an important part of our ecosystem. Um, if mosquitoes are a reason that you are anti-bromeliad. There are little um, BT mosquito bits that are mosquito uh, specific. They won't kill the other stuff. They will just kill the mosquitoes and you can put those baits in your bromeliads if that's a concern for you. Um, there's other types of mosquito repelling technologies, but I like my Columbia shirt, <laughs> even on the hot sunny days. So, um, oops. So epiphytes translates to air plant and they do live on other plants without causing harm. And they account for about 10% of all of our plant species. They include aeroids, begonias, bromeliads, heaths, nightshades, orchids, ferns, and true mosses. And Florida contains 85% of the epiphytes in the United States. It's so cool. We just need to go outside and look up. And I'm not going to lie. One of the things that is maybe the most heartbreaking thing for me when I see a big tree getting removed for a new development or something, it's, I mean, it's heartbreaking to see a tree go down. But for me, it's thinking about all the life 
that lives in the tree canopy. That takes a really long time for all of that life to develop. And we do a phenomenal job of growing new trees and tree nurseries, but they don't come with layers of life laid in on all of the branches from generations and generations of critters finding respite and safety and food in those branches. So let's not forget about all of that biodiversity, even soil that develops in tree canopies. Um, and the most diverse populations of epiphytes in Florida are located in the Fakahatchee Strand State Preserve down in Southwest Florida. Um, Clyde Butcher, is a famous Florida swamp photographer, and he really focuses on the subject of epiphytes and swamps. And I just want to take a moment to observe and wonder. Just look at the depth and the life held within a swamp. I'd like to encourage folks to just take moments to be calm and to be curious. We don't always have to learn something scientific or biological. Sometimes it might just be art or inspiration. Maybe it's just an opportunity to be calm or one with something greater than self. And that is something I am grateful for art for. So um, I think nature and shady areas can be really healthy for the mind in that way. And here are just uh, some of my favorite of Florida's epiphytes. You can get out at different times of year and you can find orchids in flower all across the state. It is just fantastic. We have cowhorn orchids that look like they're palm trees that are growing in the swamp. They have seed pods bigger than my fist. We have talansias that are twisting their ways off of branches. Um, we've had, you know, like there are books written about Florida's epiphytes, like the orchid thief. Um, so there's just a lot of curiosity and lore. And I just think our swamp is so cool. So you can see we've got orchids, talansias, and some fantastic Florida native ferns. Um, we won't take time to watch this now, but I encourage you to uh, watch some videos about the ghost orchid or to go on a little adventure through the Fakahatchee Strand State Preserve. It's amazing the things that are just uh, hidden down our Florida back roads. And this area was uh, heavily logged and it's a great example of how conservation can go a really long way in making sure that we don't lose things even once they've been heavily disturbed. It's not too late, even when things are heavily disturbed. So now we'll move on to uh, some of Florida's native woodland wonders, like the Florida native Kunti, which is more commonly found in Walmart parking lots than wildlands these days. But I think that's a great example of something that we have figured out how to cultivate. And we do include this Florida native plant in a lot of areas. And we can do a lot more of that. The Florida wild coffee, Psychotria nervosa, with this bright red berry that shows up on it. It's quite attractive and the shiny leaves can actually reflect light in really dark areas. And the Florida anise, which even has a fabulous smell when the leaves are crushed. And good old ground covers go a long way, especially in parks like managed urban landscapes. The cast iron plant is a pretty well-behaved plant. Um, it is a better option than the mother-in-law's tongue or the snake plant, um, but it's used in a very similar fashion. It just does not escape in the same way. And hostas are some other uh, less utilized plants that can provide a lot of interest in the shade. 
Liriope and Dwarf Mondo grass are some really nice uh, shade friendly ground covers that are still very low lying. They won't uh, deal with traffic quite the same as uh, some other plants, but um, these are really beautiful plants that do just fine in shade. And a few fine flowers. Here we have the bat flower which is just so fantastic and interesting. You never know what uh, curious plants might be lurking in the shade. And our uh, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, this one does great um, in like my area, central, uh, southern central Florida and further south, Bach Tower Gardens and Lou Gardens have some fantastic examples of this. This one's next on my personal list to add to the yard. And it has all these different pops of color all on one plant. Doesn't get much better than that. And then I like to round things up talking about turf. So this is an actual turf trial. So look at the turf in the foreground. That's under 90% shade cloth. This is at the Scott's Research Facility in Apopka, Florida, where they do extensive turf trials. And they have different levels of shade with different cultivars of turf growing under them. And you can see that the turf closest to us in this image is very sparse and it's very long and leggy. That turf is like stretching for the light. She is reaching and she is searching and she is not getting it. She's not happy. And then you can kind of see that progression from the foreground to the background where you can notice that the turf does thicken up as the light gets a lot brighter. So that's just a nice visual of what we know about the science of turf, which is that it's really like a minimum of about six plus hours of full sun, but there are some cultivars that can deal with about four hours minimum of full sun. We still need some full sun action because this turf and the foreground of this picture is not acceptable. There are other plants or a mulching situation that would probably be more desirable, but there are some St. Augustine dwarf cultivars like Sapphire, Seville, Delmar, Captiva, Scott's Pro Vista, and UF Citra Blue. Those are the two um, slightly newer, um, more shade tolerant turf varieties that we're really seeing a lot of interest in lately. Um, Empire Zoetia grass has a little bit more tolerance, but again, I really would like to direct folks to all of the other fantastic options for our shady areas. This is really just meant to demonstrate that it doesn't just happen like magic. There is science. And then we have um, the centipede grass, which is a bit more shade tolerant than some of the other types of grasses that can grow here in Florida, but it's more of a Northern variety, more of a Northern part of Florida panhandle type of grass. I rarely hear of people having centipede grass here in central Florida. So, um, Okay, so it's important that we talk about how um, water does move throughout the state of Florida, and that um, is something that we always need to think about. We always need to think about our, how our water moves, how our animals move, and that we are a very biodiverse state. We have a lot of endemic species that occur nowhere else in the entire world. They only occur here in Florida. And um, we need to balance our current and future development pressures with the fact that we have so many wonderful native and endemic species here. Um, so how do we look to the future of Florida incorporating our best landscaping practices, making sure that we're not just increasing temperatures with more and more pavement, but that we're mitigating those temperatures and our future development with better building practices, that we're maintaining trees, we're maintaining biodiversity, and we're creating highways above our heads for wildlife to be able to thrive.
even in and around the city. Um, so there is a huge effort called the Florida Wildlife Corridor that is um, really interesting to follow. I love following them on social media. They get a lot of positive attention from politicians, National Geographic, et cetera, et cetera. And they work with ranchers, private landowners, researchers, and they're really looking to connect the dots in this beautiful state from the areas where we, the people live to the areas that are still the last remaining wildlands in the state because we know that we need to connect our green spaces so that we can all enjoy the paradise that we live in. So thank you so much uh, for joining me today. I really um, encourage you to always think about water conservation keep thinking about all of those Florida friendly landscaping concepts that help us reduce nutrient pollution, reducing fertilizer inputs by selecting right plants for right places, putting those alternatives instead of a turf plant under a tree, put something that's meant to thrive there that doesn't need lots of attention. Grow our Florida friendly plants using best practices, connect habitats and green spaces. We can do this, whether we see the incredible life happening outside and surrounding us or not, doesn't mean it's not happening. We just have to give it an opportunity to continue to adapt, evolve, and thrive. And um, a piece for the ag, local food production helps us to make sure that we are keeping some level of green space in and around our urban areas. Um, these are the publications I started with. Um, we know where to find them, Landscaping in the Shade and our Florida Friendly Landscaping Plant Guide. Um, and this is where you can find me if you do have any questions or curiosities about any of the topics I shared today. And we'll get a little uh, very quick survey. It just helps me to keep track of the teaching and learning that we all do together. So if you wouldn't mind uh, filling out that survey when it's shared with you in the chat, I would appreciate that. And I look forward to taking any questions, comments, or curiosities that we can all share with each other. Thank you. Well, thank you, Hannah. That was amazing. That was really great. I learned a lot and, and I loved some of the images you had and, and background. But it looks like we don't have too many questions, but there are a couple in the um, Q&A box. Okay. And um, the first one that I see was, uh, is how does one go about measuring how many hours of sun each part of the yard receives, especially when the sun is filtered through an oak tree? Oh, uh, that's a really good question. And um, while I'm answering with a more technical way, um, we'll see if a uh, less technical method um, of just observation, I think is a really good way to do it. Um, but something that has been a very helpful tool in my ability to learn through the years are working with formal light meters, where you can actually see that plants eat light differently. Um, I had an opportunity to work with PAR meters. Those measure photosynthetic active radiation. They're like really expensive and it's like super nerdy, but I wish every extension office could have one of these $2,000 tools because you can actually see it, it measures the light that plants eat. And plants do not see the spectrum that us human eyes see. So when you get to use these like real analytical tools, um, you can see the difference between a full sun situation and something that looks equally as sunny um, that's right nearby, very different light spectrum. So that's a that's just a tool that you may or may not have access to in extension offices. Um, Photography light meters are pretty decent. Um, I'm not an expert, um, but there are some older school light meters that are still really good at being able to test that sensitivity of light. It's not seeing in like photosynthesis measurement, but it will help you feel what the plant is feeling, if that makes sense. And then diva plants, if something's really not thriving, um, you know, it's, it's a learn by mistakes kind of thing, but just be very observant and try to pick up on what your plants are already telling you. 
I love that phrase, diva plants. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna use that one. I'm you that. know, you know, you have them. So I do know I have some. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so next question um, is how do I how do I test to know the acid in my soil? Oh well, um, that one you a lot of our master gardener plant clinics um, at the extension offices around the state will do a pH test of your soil so you can see how um, acidic ba or basic or just kind of neutral it is. Um, they'll usually some offices might do that for free, some might do it for a few dollars, and then you can send those samples to get even more information to our UF Extension Soils Testing Lab. Um, there are other soil testing labs as well. Um, there are even ways that a lot of growers, commercial landscapers, I recommend that you have your own little tool, even if it's not as good as an analytical soils lab, there are little color indicator tests and things so that you can get an idea of what you're dealing with in, in your environment. Um, so you can select plants, the right plant for the right place. Excellent. That's great. Um, and just a couple more questions. The next one is, can too much Spanish moss kill the tree? Kill a tree. Ooh, great question. So yeah. um, the Spanish moss is uh, when you see a tree that seems to be declining, that has an abundance of Spanish moss associated with it, it's usually affiliated with the tree otherwise being in decline due to some other reason. And that Spanish moss is simply taking advantage of the tree's loss of leaves in the canopy for whatever other reason that's causing it to struggle. So think alternatively, you can probably envision massive oak trees with a crazy amount of Spanish moss that are thriving. And it's because those Southern live oaks are healthy trees. So they can support all of that Spanish moss. Um, when the Spanish moss could become an issue is when things become like so heavy on a limb. Um, that's when we see that homeowners might want to consider for more of a safety issue, um, especially when we get lots of hurricanes in one year. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. Um, now I have something that I might be able to help with this as far as some links, but the next question is, are any Florida friendly edible suggestions for this shade? Mine may not be specifically for the shade. Oh, I do think we have a new EDIS document on at least FF Florida friendly edibles. Okay. Yeah. Florida friendly and edible in the shade. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, we start, we start going a little far out and groovy, which, um, is a very fun place to be, but, uh, <laughs> um, it's I've got a link that I can put in the chat box on just Florida friendly edibles, not necessarily in the shade. Yeah. I mean, something, you know, like the Florida coon tea that, technically is edible. The root of it was uh, exploited in the state. That's why you can't find it anywhere in nature anymore. Um, but it requires some level of processing. Um, so there might be some other plants or things that might be growing in or around like our Florida muscadine grape, but it's mm -hmm. simply benefiting from the structure of the tree. And that sucker is going to grow up and take full advantage of the already existing trunk. Um, but otherwise that's that's a great question and I'm excited to think about it for the rest of the week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good one. Awesome. Thank you. Um, let's see. Another is more of a comment um, question, but it says, will the presentation be on YouTube? My HOA is skeptical about the limits of grass. They fertilize more wasting money. And um, so that's great. It, this will be on our website. Um, it may take about two weeks to get up there, but it'll be posted on our website. Great. That's great. Um, the next one is the deer moss on the plant cause or show decline. What's that? Is the deer moss. Deer moss. Is that? I'm, I'm not sure I follow. 
Yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Maybe if Elizabeth is still on, she could clarify just a little bit. Um, it, so Spanish moss, <laughs> or I mean, I, I'm thinking to me that just refers back to Spanish moss, but I may be a misunderstanding. Um, lots of people just thank you so much. Lots of people in the chat box, just thank you. Great presentation. Um, uh, one other question I, I found here is, um, should you measure the light in the summer or winter? In my yard, the seasons make a big difference and some plants are sunburned in the winter. Oh yeah, that's that's a really, really great question. Um, I think being conscientious of how the light moves in the yard um, is what to take notice of. Um, I think the shorter days in the winter would be a little bit more valuable than the longer days in the summer, just because that's when the light is going to be the most limited and when the temperatures might also be a limiting factor to consider. Um, but then it's kind of just a lot of uh, being observant where you'll notice um, you might set a plant in an area and then it is like a full sun spot and, and you'll just actually notice by the burn mark on the leaf. And if you know that you're just getting to know a new part of your landscape, make sure that you take the time to go back out there and enjoy, enjoy it. Go check on things every couple of days um, because sometimes that direct setting sun in the afternoon can like one brutal hour can be enough. And I don't really have any tips or tricks other than just take the time to you know, take some health and wellness time and just go out on a little 10 minute garden walk and just see if anything is getting the sun blasted out of it when it's uh, in that like extreme afternoon or morning sun. So great answer. Um, okay, so just one last and then and then we're going to finish up here. Um, Elizabeth got back to us. She said the deer moss, she says the gray white poofs that show up on a tree. Um, on the tree, gray white poofs on the tree. And what about them? Um, is the deer moss on the plant cause or show decline? Is it the um, So I, um, I'm not completely positive, but I would really say that it's in not maybe related to anything other than the environment just that it's there. Um, and that if you're seeing plant decline um, I, and you see um, a, a moss growing on the plant, sometimes it seems easy to go the route that that must be the reason, but I wouldn't Im immediately associate it with that. Um, that's something we think uh, if it's really moist in the area, then it could actually be an indication that things are a little too wet and a little overwatered and that moss is able to thrive there because it's wet and overwatered when actually the roots are like, oh, I'm wet and overwatered. This is torture. When that moss is like, I love it. I'm just hanging out because this is like the right environment for me to thrive. But you think, oh, the moss is causing the decline when actually the moss is just taking advantage of the favorable environment. So it's usually just an indicator if there is decline associated with it to just put on your sleuthing goggles and dig a little deeper, talk with your master gardener volunteers, talk with your local commercial whore agents to help overcome what seems like is the problem, might just be telling you there's more to the story. Wonderful. Awesome. Well, uh, Hannah, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, this has been a you. great presentation and, and I really enjoyed it. It looks like everybody else did too. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. It's been a lot of fun. I really love this topic from the big picture to real act, just plants that you maybe hadn't thought about before. So thanks for giving me the opportunity and thank you all for joining us this morning.